You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Arvind Panagaria from Columbia University. Arvind, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Uh, Thank you, Garrett. Uh, Really uh, pleased to be uh, with you today. So Arvind is the author of a new book entitled Free Trade and Prosperity, How Openness Helps Developing Countries Grow Richer and Combat Poverty, which will be the topic of our discussion today. So I thought we could start the discussion with a little historical background. We don't want to go too far. So the history of, you know, the sort of modern history of of development right maybe starts around uh, the end of world war 2 and right. the the independence uh, a lot of these countries gaining independence do you want to talk about the the development model they used uh, at starting then and and continuing on to the present that's good that's a very good point to start at uh, garrett so you know after the second world war many of the countries that had been colonies uh, of many of the european countries began to win their freedom and uh, uh, these all eventually came to be known as the developing countries they started launching their development programs and there's this very interesting contrast that emerges uh, as we come out of the Second World War between the developed countries and the developing countries. The thinking was that the developed countries needed freer trade uh, to rebuild their economies uh, after the Second World War had uh, devastated them. And uh, this was an effort led very much jointly by the United States and United Kingdom. And this led to the formation of this General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, which eventually became the institution for uh, uh, liberalizing trade uh, among the developed countries. Uh, Now, alongside, uh, uh, at the time at least, uh, uh, as we began to get into 1950s and developing countries began to launch their development programs, the thinking also was that uh, the developing countries could not grow rapidly without protection. And and the idea was was simply this, that everybody thought in terms of a too good model, uh, that there was agriculture and there was industry. Agriculture largely meaning the primary products in which the developing countries had comparative advantage uh, uh, would not serve as the engine of growth, meaning, you know, particularly if they were using this as the export-led engine of growth, because the demand is highly inelastic for these products, both as it res- as demand responds uh, to income changes, as well as it responds to price changes. So both price elasticity and income elasticity were, were thought to be low. And so they, the argument was that any attempts to ex- Export more of these products will result in declining prices for the products and uh, therefore declining revenues ultimately. And that, of course, uh, would then, you know, defeat any efforts uh, to raise productivity or to raise uh, uh, investment in uh, these primary products. And so, therefore, industrialization was the way to go. Now, you know, if, if we want to industrialize and you think that you are all importers of these products, then protection becomes the right instrument. Uh, And to give this uh, uh, protection some intellectual backing, uh, uh, the infant industry argument was to some degree invented, I would say. Um, uh, And and that is how it went. Now, you know, historically, very interestingly, as the uh, 50s ended and 60s began, um, some of the countries in East Asia, uh, which later came to be known as the East Asian Tigers, uh, these were Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and uh, South Korea. Uh, so these four countries uh, uh, decided to go outward oriented. Uh, and the way they defied the model that everybody was thinking in terms of, you know, this primary product versus industry product was that, they, uh, that you know, industry was not a monolith. You know, industry consisted of many different products. And some of these products uh, were highly labor intensive. The products like you know clothing, footwear, uh, some of the uh, uh, light manufacturers, uh, uh, items of day-to-day use in uh, kitchen and our everyday life, furniture, those sorts of things. Uh, they thought that well, you know, some of these products they had a comparative advantage. You know, they could export, so they were 
some industrial products that they could export and others that they would import machinery obviously that they would import so they in in, in fact took a different tack started opening up their economies GATT was, of course, also leading to the opening of the developed country economies. So export markets began to open up for these countries as well. Uh, and uh, they took off. Uh, you know, uh, these countries, four of them, uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, practically 8 to 10% rate of growth they registered. And uh, uh, it was a completely different scenario from what what uh, the, the 1950s policymakers, including economists, uh, were advising. 1970s, then a lot of the rethinking happens in the profession. Uh, 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 there were uh, at least three big projects that got done. One was by the OECD, uh, another by the uh, uh, NBER. Uh, OECD led by Ian Little, uh, the NBER one led by uh, Jagdish Bhagwati and Ann Krieger. Uh, and then there was a World Bank project led by Bela Balasa. Uh, all three of these did comparative studies of the uh, some of the East Asian tiger economies versus countries like India, China, Egypt, etc. Uh, and they found, of course, that uh, uh, ultimately the, the the idea that somehow uh, uh, developing countries needed protection was the wrong one. Uh, uh, free trade was as good for uh, the developing countries as it was for the developed countries, and so the conventional wisdom actually changed uh, and and. Uh, some of the uh, uh, economists, uh, I, I, you know, talk about it in the book, uh, like Jagdish Bhagwati, uh, uh, Ian Little. These economists had sort of approved of protection uh, or import substitution uh, to some degree, at least uh, in the fifties. They became very strong advocates of free trade, and so later, of course, you know, we go into the eighties. Uh, 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 then the reaction begins, and there is an emergence of these. The what came to be called revisionists. These were like Alice Amston, uh, who wrote on Korea. Uh, uh, we had Robert Wade, who wrote on Taiwan. Uh, later, these were both polit uh, political scientists. And later we got, you know, economists like Danny Roderick, uh, Jun Chang, uh, who joined in. And they sort of reinterpreted the whole history of these East Asian tigers, arguing that, uh, oh, it was not free or trade, but selective protection, industrial policy, that gave rise to their success. And so this is sort of, you know, the, the, the broad history. And, and then the book, uh, my book also tries to respond in a big way to uh, the, the reinterpretation uh, or revisionism uh, by these authors. And so I go into, you know, various arguments that these revisionists make, and, and, I, and I try to counter those. Okay. So, so it sounds like there's been sort of a, a pendulum swinging back and forth between the idea of protection as a tool of development and, and openness. Uh, do, do you want to uh, just uh, give a bit of a deeper explanation of, of what the, the whole infant industries argument is? What, what's the, the central idea there? So just by way of you know completing the the thought on, on, on uh, uh, protection versus free trade, also historical one, uh, today, we also stand, you know, at, at, at a very interesting juncture uh, because uh, there seems to be some reversal that now a lot of the developing countries have actually come to embrace uh, free trade. Today, you know, the developing countries are way, way more open than they were, ever were in the 50s, 60s and even 70s. So, so this, to a very large degree, have embraced free trade. Uh, but the fears have now come into the developed countries, right? As you say, President Trump, you know, uh, uh, going after China and uh, there's some threat also uh, going after India and so forth. So, so there's suddenly this uh, uh, thing has uh, ironically reversed itself that uh, free trade is good for developing countries, but may not be so good, particularly when it comes to imports from the developing countries for the developed countries. So, I mean, I just mentioned that as, as the current. Uh, uh, state of play, but uh, turning you know to to the question you have asked uh, on on infant industry protection. So see uh, the 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 idea was age old one uh, um, uh, uh, even going back to uh, uh, late nineteenth century and so forth. Uh, that you know um, uh, somehow uh, when countries start their development process, their industries are new, they are not established, uh, and so you know potentially they could become competitive. Uh, but 
uh, the problem is that uh, they begin, they try to start off, but they get outcompeted by the imports that are coming uh, from the very established industries abroad. And so, you know, they need to uh, need some protection to begin growing. So now a lot of, you know, the, this is a sort of plausible argument and it has played out uh, throughout the history. But uh, when you examine it very carefully, uh, uh, one by one, you find that, you know, the, the plausibility begins to go away, particularly based on this infant industry character. So, so for instance, the first set of uh, uh, criticisms, which came pretty early on in the early 1950s, because, you know, as, as it began to be invoked, as the argument of infant industry protection began to be invoked, economists also began to look at it more carefully, it dissect it more carefully, the logic behind it. Uh, it, you know, earlier in and until the middle of the 20th century, you know, the idea had reasonable acceptance. And partly it was because, you know, nobody was in the developed countries, nobody was appealing to it. But once it began to be a, taken seriously in the context of the developing countries, challenges, I mean, intellectual re-examination also started. So the you know first point which uh, was made by James Mead, uh, I, I, I would say, was that, look, you know, um, if you uh, think that there are these economies of scale, the idea was that uh, you have to learn. And as you learn, your costs decline. But here, uh, uh, if the learning actually is happening at the level of the firm, and the firm knows that my costs today may be higher, but tomorrow they will fall. And so my overall, if I take the full lifetime uh, profitability of my venture, it is a profitable venture, then it really doesn't need protection because future profits will more than offset in net present value terms the losses that I'll make today. So first of all, if the argument is based on learning at the level of the firm uh, and, the and, and the venture is profitable, viable over the longer run, then you don't need protection. All you need is that the firm be able to borrow from uh, the banks uh, or other sources to cover its losses in the early years. And uh, so the issue then turns on the capital markets, uh, uh, but, but that's a capital markets issue. And capital markets issue can arise independently of the infant industry protection. Uh, so, you know, capital market issue, if they are imperfect, then protection issue would arise even absent any infant industry considerations. So, first of all, on its own accord, as far as the economies are internal to the firm, uh, uh, internal to that particular enterprise or venture, uh, the argument doesn't uh, uh, logically uh, hold water. So, Mead himself pointed out that, look, you know, but if the economies are external to the firm, so that, you know, what happens is that I am producing today, costs will decline tomorrow, but not, not just for myself, but for everybody else. Uh, because somehow, you know, whatever good that I do in terms of learning becomes available to everybody uh, 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 tomorrow. In which case, I know that I will not, you know, make any profits tomorrow because competition will happen. Uh, uh, others uh, who have done no learning uh, will outcompete me uh, and I'll not be able to recover my costs today. So that was this sort of argument that did actually gain acceptance among economists that, you know, you, you, if you've got some external economies of scale, as they came to be called, external learning by doing economies of scale, that my, learn, my learning spills over to everybody else. So it seemed a logically correct argument. But uh, in 1969, uh, Robert Baldwin of Wisconsin University, he published a very powerful art, uh, paper article in the Journal of Political Economy, pointing out that uh, even that argument really doesn't go. Now, it's very interesting that somehow this, uh, you know, perhaps it was because of the way Baldwin's article was written. Uh, they, they, uh, you keep seeing subsequently articles on infant industry protection coming. And uh, to a reader, it's a bit of a puzzle that, you know, uh, uh, Baldwin says in no uncertain terms that, you know, uh, infant industry uh, protection uh, proponents have simply not provided a logical argument. And it's a paper published in the JPE, our uh, uh, leading journal, uh, 
Uh, and yet you see these papers coming, you know, uh, uh, by subsequent authors. Uh, there is articles by Pranav Ferdhan. There is articles by some of the more recent authors as well. Uh, 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 and so the puzzle to me was that why these two things exist. And finally, I answer that question in 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 the book uh, that uh, you know uh, Baldwin's point was the following. Really, I mean, if you if if you fully uh, grasp it, what what he said was, look, you know. Basically, what you have to assume is mechanically, if I produce today, somehow mechanically, everybody's cost tomorrow will decline. And so I will not go into business. But if you give me protection today to cover my losses today, then I'll go into business. And then, of course, everybody can compete. Profits will drop to zero. But that's fine. Industry, which was viable, uh, comes into existence. But Baldwin's point was that, well, what is the source of this externality? Is it that today I am, you know, investing in innovation, which unfortunately I cannot keep secret and it becomes available to everybody. Uh, and so then I will not invest in innovation unless I get some um, uh, 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 something in return for it. Or is it that I'm training the workers uh, and I'm investing in training and that training will then spill over to others uh, as an externality? Is it the argument? So then Baldwin explained that, look, you know, it, it, once you specify this source of externality, how this uh, external uh, learning by doing is spilling over to the other firms that will come into existence tomorrow. One, if you specify that, then the argument for infantry protection collapses, not, not an argument for intervention. Intervention would still work, but protection will not work. So he said that, look, you know, so suppose my cost of uh, innovation is a certain amount and uh, you cover that cost, uh, you know, you give me enough protection that, uh, uh, that, uh, that innovation is viable for me to do innovation. But what I will do is I will still not do any innovation. Why? Because why should I invest in an innovation? If you're giving me protection, I will just use my old technology produce using the old technology, make whatever extra profits I can make today. Because if I invest in innovation, I can tomorrow I cannot recoup the gains to the innovation because it will become available to everybody. So tomorrow when I go out, everybody my cost will drop to whatever is everybody else's cost. And therefore, I can never recoup it. So I will already anticipate that. I'll say, sorry, I'm not going to you give me protection. I'll produce today. Uh, but innovation will not happen. And as far as the training of workers is concerned, workers know that they are getting something valuable from me. And I know that I'm giving something valuable to the workers. So I can internalize that. So I would give them, uh, commit them to lower wages today because their productivity today is lower. And uh, uh, tomorrow when the productivity rises, I'll be able to commensurately pay them higher wages also. So once you specify how this externality travels from the uh, 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 initial incumbent firm to the other firms tomorrow, uh, how the learning transmits. Once the process is, uh, that transmission process is specified, uh, the argument collapses. So logically, I conclude in the book that there is in fact no logical argument for infant industry protection. And, and I go into then in many different details. So that's about the right. infant industry protection. Yeah, so so to to sort of summarize that argument or the counter argument against uh, infant industry is that the infant industry theory proves too much, and it it if its assumptions were true, then it would essentially prove that innovation is always impossible because no firm could internalize the value of innovating, which is you know clearly empirically false, and also if even if it were true would not justify protectionism as as a means to spur innovation if if anything it would justify a, a patent system or or some kind of subsidy to innovators absolutely i think you got it right exactly i'm glad you know that that is exactly the the, the conclusion i draw there that uh, uh, in in such situation either a patent or uh, you know if you can monitor then a subsidy on innovation uh, uh, covering the cost of innovation uh, uh, or the government, you know, separately financing innovation uh, through R&D. That sort of thing will certainly work. So a case for intervention certainly exists when uh, uh, these these um, learning economies uh, exist, but uh, but not for protection. 
So um, what then is this uh, newer mm-hmm. idea of industrial targeting? Is, is that just uh, the infant industry's argument revised for the modern world or is there something more to it? No, I think ultimately, you know, uh, at the heart of it, uh, uh, logically, it, it is back to always uh, some sort of infant industry uh, argument uh, that they are making. But they never make it explicit, you know. So, so there are these very vague claims make, well, there are externalities, there is this, and so therefore uh, there, there is uh, this argument. Sometimes they try to sort of fag it on, uh, take Hajun Cheng, for example, you know, uh, often the way he argues, uh, it is that, uh, you know, uh, some sort of post hoc fallacy, as it is called, you know, that uh, uh, because this happened before that, uh, that happened because of what happened before. So take, he takes the example of Korean auto industry that, um, you know, the, uh, uh, or sorry, the Japanese auto industry that uh, the Japanese had, uh, uh, you know, kicked out uh, the American auto manufacturers in the late 1930s, and then it, uh, 1950s, co- uh, Japanese auto industry was having problem, and and the Japanese uh, uh, assisted that through some interventions, financial and otherwise. Uh, and lo and behold, you know, come 80s, uh, the 19, the the auto industry in Japan became such a major challenge to the United States, uh, and so it was a great success of infant industry protection. So this is, that's how it's sort of argued. It sounds very plausible, you know, if you're not uh, uh, well-versed in economics. But it is a pure post hoc fallacy that just because these things were done, therefore the success happened. But, you know, how can you be sure that uh, even if the Japanese auto industry from the late 30s or uh, even in the 1950s had disappeared, it would not have come back uh, uh, afterwards when Korean, uh, when, when the Japanese uh, became much more capital abundant when uh, capital became cheaper and they became much more technologically uh, savvy. The, the industry would have come uh, back in its own, into its own, and it would have uh, 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 succeeded. Uh, we don't know what the counterfactual is. Uh, and, and one has to ask the question, what of all the costs that got imposed uh, through this protection on the uh, Japanese consumers? So, so often this is plausible, you know, it's to the ear, to the uninitiated, it sounds plausible, but uh, the, the logical scrutiny uh, leads to different conclusions. Uh, and, and certainly none of those who have argued about uh, infant, successful infant industry protection have done a proper cost-benefit analysis to show that the costs that were uh, imposed on uh, these consumers and others uh, in uh, in the earlier stages by uh, protecting and therefore denying the consumers uh, the access to the cheaper goods abroad uh, are offset by the benefits that are subsequently reaped. So you you can't just say that, oh, because at some point in time the industry succeeds, therefore infant industry protection succeeded. One has to do a proper cost-benefit analysis which they have not done. And, you know, mm-hmm. one of the things is that, that in practical terms, uh, you know, the, the, the problem with protection is that uh, often when you're protecting industries, you're going for your least efficient industries. You know, who is ailing the most? You know, those who are the least productive are the ones ailing the most. And therefore, their ability to, to, to politically mobilize protection is a lot higher then of the export industries. But whereas if you actually actively seek to go out for the export industries, I mean, I'm not an advocate of ex- export subsidies, but, but if you are going to intervene, intervening on behalf of the export industries turns out to be a lot better because you're going to pick industries which are on the verge of having comparative advantage. So you're not picking industries you know, that, that, are, that you are the least efficient in. Uh, instead, you are picking industries where you know you're not efficient enough today, but with some intervention, maybe you go in uh, and and export. Also, uh, export when when you intervene on behalf of exporter, you are, you are making them then compete in the world markets. This is different, you know, because in the world markets you're competing against the best in the world. Uh, your uh, ability, it, uh, it, so so then you know you have to also paddle very hard so that you can remain competitive. Uh, you learn from the technology diffusion that happens from the 
your your more efficient uh, competitors in the global economy so those arguments also lead you know more towards if you are going to intervene if you feel you must intervene I, as i said i don't recommend it but if you want to intervene better to intervene on behalf of exporters rather than import competing inefficient industries mhm yeah yeah so in in many cases you know this the sort of standard free trade argument and if another country can produce some good much cheaper than you can right. it it doesn't make sense to you know you're just you're simply wasting resources to try producing it yourself absolutely um there there might be an argument for national defense if you know, having your own steel industry or something just so so that if you get into a war with the other country you know then you still have steel so you can fight that but uh, that's that's sort of a a rare exception it doesn't apply to uh to most goods and uh i mean hopefully you just shouldn't get into wars if you avoid it <laughs> right. um, yeah yeah and and you know on national defense grounds you know you can say maybe you can protect the defense industry but even actually mm-hmm. you know for steel industry it's a, it's a hard sell if you think about it uh mm-hmm. protecting steel because steel goes into so many other things and the trade is so multilateral Uh, it's not as though you have one source of steel abroad right? uh, there there's so many different sources of steel so uh, if if country a refuses uh, to supply there is country b and there is country c so it's a hard sell even you know but but you know fine uh, uh, logically a national defense argument is there so <laughs> logically one one, uh, one would not argue that there is no national defense argument you can make that but as you said yourself uh, garrett it's a rare it's 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 more of an exception kind of argument rather than the rule so um are are there uh do we have some good examples of countries that tried both openness and protection as a sort of side by side we can look at for for how those two strategies worked out in the real world yeah no no so so that i that that is the bulk of my book Mm-hmm. uh and uh, the way i put the matter put the quest the, the put this point is that look you know uh often in the developing countries the political economy of liberalization tends to be difficult one uh and uh, um, uh, if you make uh, arguments along the lines of comparative advantage that look you know produce what you are the best at and export those and things that you produce at a very high cost just import those they don't go far enough uh, uh, politically somehow you know uh, the preoccupation uh, in in the developing countries is poverty is with poverty uh, which is a perfectly sensible thing to do uh, they they are uh, com- they are you know fighting to quickly uh, reduce and eventually eliminate the abject poverty so poverty is this sort of at the heart of the matter and then the question really then is uh, to convince the developing countries whether poverty can be uh, reduced faster by competing abroad by being uh, open uh, to free trade uh, and and that brings us also to the effects of trade on growth so so both you know how trade impacts growth and how it impacts poverty those are very important questions for the developing countries so a substantial part of my book uh, uh, is devoted to looking at the effects of growth uh, effects of trade Uh, or effects of openness on uh, growth as well as on poverty and i do that uh, both uh, in uh, uh, by looking at the cross country studies that have been done uh, using you know some of the econometric models and so forth also but i also uh, look at a large number of countries country study country case studies uh, so the four asian tiger economies singapore hong kong um, uh, uh, south korea and taiwan so these i call the miracles of yesteryear uh, and i look at two uh, contemporary uh, successes china and india which i call the miracles of today and i look at those and then there is a long chapter which uh, deals with the in 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 brief with uh, african economies and latin american economies and uh, in the chapters first that look at the full cross country experience the the bottom line i draw is the following that you know if uh, what empirical evidence clearly shows is that uh, openness in the sense of uh, either very low level of protection through as measured as measured by tariffs 
or declining tariffs or declining protection has been an essential part of almost every success story so any any successful case you 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 take uh, across the board you know and today we have the data on a large number of countries beginning from 1960 so if you look at that evidence uh, it it's very clear that uh, uh, either protection is low to begin with or protection starts out high and countries begin to liberalize so either low protection or declining protection are uh, uh, a necessary part of the story of the success of almost every country sometimes people also argue that look you know uh, opening to trade could destroy the industries and uh, destroy growth etc so i also look at some of the failures so i look at look at all the cases where growth was uh, uh, either per capita income growth was either zero or negative and i reject the hypothesis completely that you know that these countries are are growing at a negative rate or at zero rate in per capita terms because a lot of imports are coming in you just don't see the import surges by and large coming into these countries when they are declining whereas if you look at the success stories whether you look at policy as to whether protection was low or it was declining or you look at the outcome which is trade that was was trade expanding was trade, uh, even exports to gdp ratio or imports to gdp ratio was rising during those periods answer is yes uh, so that evidence comes very strong in our profession of course in uh, for economists causation is a big debate uh, which is difficult to establish because you know there is interdependence that per capita incomes uh, 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 can be high because you are because you, uh, uh, trade is helping your per capita incomes but causation may be flowing the other way that as your per capita incomes rise you also export more and so there is a this what we call in economics the identification problem so on that also uh, uh, some very uh, fast breaking work done by uh, uh, frankel and romer uh, and uh, frankel and andrew rose this is uh, um, uh, jeffrey frankel at harvard and uh, andrew uh, andy rose at uh, university of california berkeley uh, their papers uh, uh, what they do a very clever thing that they say that look you know at least there is some part of trade which is very robustly explained by distance between countries and so they say well let's take this trade which is based solely on distance uh, the, a part of the trade that is explained by distance and then see whether this particular trade uh, that can be explained by this distance variable uh, uh, also leads to rising per capita incomes and uh, uh, of course the evidence comes out very very strong that uh, indeed uh, in this sense uh, even the there is a direct causation effect causal effect of trade on openness so that's my kind of you know uh, um, very quick uh, rundown on the cross country evidence that exists and and the establishment of the causation uh, then i also look at the uh, poverty effects and those also come out to be pretty strong uh, much of the poverty effect of course comes from faster growth uh, and uh, which is quite entirely plausible that you know when you grow in a poor country when you are growing you typically end up lifting all the boats uh, now all boats may not rise equally but but they all rise so uh, uh, that that effect uh, also is 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 pretty strong and i cite all the evidence and then the country case studies so you know if you, uh, if uh, if you would like i could walk through a little bit of uh, uh, the south korean experience which is which is pretty successful yeah yeah so south korea is uh, an interesting one i've uh, i've uh, been there and it's a great country to to visit and it's it's very impressive that uh, just how you know that it's now just a developed modern country when uh you know one if you if you were taking bets 100 years ago you probably would not have have bet on it so so what went right in south korea yeah yeah so you are absolutely right because i also uh, you know that it was my heart's wish to visit south korea which i did uh, only that less than 6 months ago i had mm. studied a lot about it so, so i was very pleased to visit myself yeah so and and as you said very rightly very very rightly uh, you will not take a bet on south korea uh, south korea in 1950 was the second poorest country 
and it had been devastated by the uh, uh, the Korean War in the early 1950s. Uh, about a million people had died, uh, so the devastation was was totally huge. And uh, uh, but uh, even the view in the United States was that you know uh, you couldn't take a bet on South Korea, uh, uh, and so much so that the uh, U.S. was giving a lot of aid in the 1950s. And it decided that this is this is this is a country that's not going to succeed, and therefore they withdrew all economic aid. Military aid continued, but a very massive, you know, in relation to their own GDP, quite the the, the aid, economic aid itself was quite massive, which gradually they cut out. Um, so so this is this makes you know South Korea doubly interesting. So what happens, uh, you know, in, in, uh, at, at that. Um, uh, uh, initially, their exports were largely agricultural, uh, and in the 1950s, they did some import substitution, and so they they uh, protected the industries like apparel, um, uh, uh, footwear, etc. And uh, in most of these light manufacturers, they they had more or less accomplished uh, uh, the goal of uh, uh, replacing. Uh, imports by domestic output at this stage uh, uh, the, the, the issue came that you know what should be the next uh, uh, step for south korea whether they should continue to import substitute and therefore now go to the second stage where you start um, uh, protecting some of the intermediate uh, industries some of the machinery industries or uh, instead of doing that you continue the expansion of these labor-intensive manufacturers, uh, the uh, apparel and furniture and, um, uh, and uh, uh, anything else that, that the market would pick up uh, and become exporters of those products. Uh, and so the decision was made that they would go for the second approach, which is to rely more on exports and, and take advantage of the uh, very large world markets. Uh, because they felt, you know, you couldn't exploit economies of scale sufficiently domestically, and particularly as it came to uh, the more kind of capital-intensive kind of industries. So it, it, they felt that this would be a bit of a self-defeating thing because uh, the scale will be so small that they will probably never become competitive, and not in the near future anyway. So they chose to to uh, then go for the world markets. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things they did, I think, in 1959, it's documented more accurately in the book, uh, that uh, uh, they began to uh, uh, allow exporters duty-free access to all their intermediate inputs. And uh, then there were also a couple of major devaluations done uh, in the early 1960s. And that those two measures made many of the exportable products more profitable. Now, here, there was no targeting being done. The, you know the the incentive, meaning that that the barriers that they were removing uh, uh, through uh, uh, duty free access to, uh, to to the to the exporters, meaning duty free access to intermediate inputs for the exporters, and the devaluation, they were largely neutral measures. You know they were not selecting out any specific commodities. And later on, after 1964, there, there was another major devaluation and so forth. So so whatever was profitable in to export to begin with, through devaluation it became even more more profitable. So so that is how it it, it helped the exports, uh, and uh, uh, the exports really took off. Uh, and beginning in 1963, South Korea also shifted to a high growth trajectory. You know, growth rate was eight percent plus in in 1963, and it sustained. And they sustained the policies also, of course. Uh, and so you see the decade of 1963 to 1973, there is a, a massive expansion of exports. They become from, you know, from something close to or below 5%. Exports as a proportion of GDP become close to about 20%. Again, I'm guessing the numbers, but, but they're in that range. And GDP grew about 8 to about 9% or so. Uh, so a whole decade, you know, GDP grew at, at about 9%. And uh, if you look at the poverty numbers in somewhere, you know, going in mid seventies, which also I report in the in the book, uh, poverty also comes uh, crashing down big time. And uh, remarkable thing is that in South Korea, poverty, th this initial poverty reduction is happening totally uh, through growth because there is not a whole lot of uh, social spending uh, 
uh, or a, any sort of redistributive policies that are um, helping the poor. It's simply the growth. Because even with this, uh, uh, you know, this 8-9% growth, the wages had been rising 8-10% to 10% a year. Uh, and this is happening against the backdrop of a massive migration of, for, of workforce out of agriculture into industry. So not only, and services, of course, because, you know, as industry grows, people spend more of their income. And because services tend to be non-traded, services also pick up. So both, you know, uh, first the industry or manufacturing kind of picks up and that uh, leads to uh, a second round effect on services. So you see this massive migration of agricultural workforce. uh, uh, And even then, industry and services, while absorbing this extra labor, uh, are able to pay wages that are growing growing annually at about eight to ten percent. So, so there is an incredible story. Now, some of the controversial issues that come out. So, here, for example, Danny Roderick argues that oh, you know, if you look at my look at the trade figures, then um, exports really don't quite pick up uh, till uh, after the growth has picked up. That the growth had been kicked up in 1963, and when you look at exports. Uh, 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 exports uh, uh, actually pick up after 1964. So he says, well, therefore, the trade could not have been the reason, uh, certainly not the initial catalyst. But he gets it wrong because uh, uh, he's looking at total trade, total exports. Now, what happens is that the agriculture was not doing very well in terms of the exports. So the share of agriculture in exports had begun to decline in the uh, starting in 1961 already. And manufacturing was replacing. Now, the policy was basically, uh, uh, when they opened up, uh, the policy was supposed to help the manufacturers. And, of course, if you look at, you know, if you decompose the total exports into agriculture and manufacturing, manufacturing exports are rising at a massive rate. You know, something like on the order of 60% or more per year between 1961 and 1964. So, the it, it, manufacturing exports really took off and 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 they largely... Uh, you know, initially start they start out some 25-30% of the total exports. By 1964, they are about close to 60% of the total exports. So uh, the response, in fact, was happening to the policy, first to manufacturers, manufacturing exports, and that then fed into the GDP growth as well. And, and during this decade, by the way, also 63 to 73, there is no industrial targeting going on. You know, uh, the the uh, whatever policy changes were being made uh, to remove obstacles to exports. Uh, I mean, there was no by no means a free trade economy. Uh, import restrictions existed, but imports were coming because throughout uh, this period, 60 to 73, Korea runs a, a fairly large uh, current, current account deficit. So, so there is no question that the, that the imports are coming. It's not a mercantilist kind of uh, model either. Uh, and you see, uh, uh, in a neutral way, the meaning that as far as all the exports are concerned, you're not targeting any specific ones, uh, uh, they grow. And one sort of uh, evidence which uh, tells you that this was uh, uh, no targeting was going on during this period uh, is the fact that uh, if you look at in 1963, the hair, human hair, which is called the wigs, you know, the uh, 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 they are not even in the export basket, zero. By 1970 or 71, uh, the, the wigs are becoming about 10% of the total exports. You know, nobody could have even predicted, let alone, you know, uh, uh, target those exports. And a very similar story you can see in, in Taiwan. You know, num- many products that initially were not even in the export basket uh, uh, begin to be exported once they turn uh, to the export-oriented strategy. Uh, so now, where does the this whole thing about industri- industrial targeting, uh, selective protection come from? What happens now is that you know Korea f- uh, begins to f- uh, find uh, some pressures in, uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, some of it was coming from the U.S. decision that they were going to reduce military and you know uh, uh, some of their presence, and and there was also a bit fears being raised that. Uh, 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 protectionism might rise against the Korean exports to the United States and so forth. So they somehow these pressures lead them to turn to uh, 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 import substitution. Some of it may also have happened because, you know, the moment you begin to see that, oh, so much imports are coming in, uh, uh, often you think that, oh, you know, uh, I could replace these imports by my domestic production and that will add to my GDP. 
because the link to see that you know as i start protecting my exports will also fall or will begin to rise much more slowly uh, is difficult to see that link is difficult to see so so you know whatever the reasons uh, around 1973 korea begins this uh, policy which is called the heavy and chemical industry drive uh, this is called the hci heavy and chemical industry drive and so a number of industries they begin to protect so this is the phase uh, that begins you know and and when those who are arguing that korea succeeded through this is uh, targeting and, and industrial protection they are talking of the period starting from 73 which they never make clear because there is a whole decade from 1963 to 1973 when korea did no protection whatsoever i mean it it, it was not ta- no targeting or, or industrial uh, I, i i mean in the form of either industrial policy or selective protection there was no targeting from 63 to 73 and korea grew 9% during that period already now the targeting as i said uh, uh, through hci the heavy and chemical industry drive starts in 1973 and uh, uh, the outcome of course of that targeting really is that the growth rate during this period is below 7% they lose about a couple of percentage points in growth so it's not certainly such a huge success story and uh, there are studies which look at the productivity growth etc uh, by david dollar uh, and which i uh, refer to and they also show that you know during this period the productivity growth in the protected industry was not that high uh, so the evidence clearly d- doesn't show that the these industries were really succeeding in a big way uh, there is also you know a big story of this ball bearing company that they started that they invested in it was highly capital intensive and you know they it was too large scale the scale was so large they were not competitive in the world markets domestically they couldn't consume all the ball bearings so the whole uh, you know you, you had this massive uh, factory uh, with very few workers employed and it was operating uh, two days or a week or something because that's all they could absorb in the domestic economy the market was not large enough so you know you also get these stories of massive inefficiency that uh, was uh, 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 inducted into the economy as a result of this uh, premature kind of uh, uh, capital intensive industry drive but you know i think the broader point i make in the book is that look you know and and this is not my point as ian little uh, and, and others have made it well before and they argued that look you know korea was becoming more capital intensive wages had risen for 10 years uh, at 9 to 10% so labor scarcity was beginning to happen already and some of this transition into the capital intensive capital intensive industries would have happened automatically through the markets what the hci drive did was to speed it up uh, it made it happen faster but there was a cost that was paid because at the end of the day uh, the the performance of the economy uh, did not do very well and it so happens as we end the 1970s there is a macroeconomic crisis which uh, leads uh, korea to abandon the hci drive and uh, they return to the neutral policies and lo and behold you know 1982 to 95 uh, you got a whole more than a decade when growth goes back to more than 9% so so it's not a very big success story you know again hajun chang etc come back and say oh you know but today how can you argue like that because today the auto industry is so successful today the, the you know certain such successful is again post hoc fallacy it's a post hoc fallacy that it doesn't mean that, that you know just uh, if if korea had not protected these industries doesn't mean they would have never come up you know the korea was developing comparative advantage in more capital intensive industries and the transition would have happened that happens automatically as incomes rise uh, so 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 just to point to the success today and say oh therefore that policy was good policy uh, i i think this doesn't uh, uh, cut it i mean you got to have uh, a proper cost benefit analysis to show that uh, uh, protection benefits far exceeded or certainly exceeded the extra cost you paid so um, you know uh, I, i think the korean example in this respect is a good one and really my own reading of it is that none of the arguments that uh, are made by either Danny Rodrick or or uh, Hajun Chang or uh, Robert Wade etc stand to careful scrutiny mm. so i think we have time for maybe 
one more example or, or discussion. Uh, do do you have um, any economies in mind that are sort of a counterexample to this? Any any countries that that didn't do so well uh, because they failed to adopt an open policy? Yeah. So so you know, from recent years, there's one particularly puzzling country. There's one puzzling country, uh, which is Mexico. Uh, now, of course, you know, as, as a general argument, uh, nothing else has worked very well in Mexico either. But still, it, it, is an in, it, it is a bit of a counterintuitive example for us, you know, who, uh, who advocate free trade, uh, that Mexico, you know, starting in, uh, let's say, late, even actually 80s on, they had done some uh, late 80s, that's uh, unilaterally the liberalized markets. But uh, more importantly, you know, they signed the free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, and uh, that was certainly a lot of freeing up of trade. Uh, now, often, you see, one of the reasons uh, uh, whenever uh, liberalization of trade does not work very well, uh, it is often the case that trade itself never responded to your outward-oriented policies. And that can happen maybe because, uh, you know, the infrastructure uh, is not good enough. So even though your tariffs are low, goods can't move uh, through the ports. You know, you may have major bottlenecks at the ports, goods or internal infrastructure may be poor, things like that, you know. So, and, and so if trade never responded, then certainly you can't expect the follow-up uh, effects on growth or poverty, etc. So that, that is certainly intuitively explainable. Mexico's case is more puzzling because trade did respond. So you do see massive expansion of both exports and imports in the Mexican case uh, post uh, NAFTA. Uh, but the growth uh, effects don't materialize. Mexico has continued to grow at low rates. So I discussed that case in, in greater detail. And, and uh, um, uh, Gordon Henson has done some very good work on that, uh, which I refer to and I draw upon. And there were some other authors as, as well on whose work I draw. And, and uh, the explanation largely to me is that, you know, the almost the bulk of uh, expansion of trade that has happened is, is, is the trade at the border from the so-called maquiladoras. And, and that's a processing trade that inputs come from the United States and uh, they get processed and uh, they get exported back to the United States. And, and so when you look at the final trade figures, they do look pretty large uh, and expanding uh, significantly. But what has happened is that these maquiladoras then don't connect back to the remainder of the Mexican economy as very well. And, and so the, the benefits that normally flow from trade to the rest of the economy simply have not filtered down. And the reasons for that are... Uh, have to do with uh, the, the, the internal reforms uh, in, in the economy. There's still, in some of the service industries, you've got these men monopolies and telecommunications. Of course, it's a big, big example along those lines. Uh, but um, in general, the policy regime in Mexico, outside of the maquiladoras, seems to have been such that, uh, you know, firm size remains very small. And, and so, you know, if firms remain very tiny, that typically remain unproductive or, 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 or un, um, performing at very low productivity levels and wages remain low also. So uh, uh, those are the reasons it, it would seem. So it will still require a lot of internal reform in Mexico. So, so at least on the surface, certainly Mexico appears to be a bit of a puzzling case. But if you look at the more uh, details, uh, uh, it, 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 it is explained. And and. Um, Nevertheless, you know, I think that that was to me when I looked at the trade growth in Mexico, I was quite astonished. So I, I had to go back and look <laughs> at what uh, other experts uh, who looked at Mexico had said. Uh, and, and generally, the explanations are about along these lines that that outside the maquiladoras, you end up with a lot of monopolistic kind of uh, behavior and just general inefficiencies that exist. Uh, uh, so, so on the one hand, and on the other, of course, you also end up with this mass of uh, very tiny little firms which don't grow, and so that kind of remains a bit uh, an economy. Uh, so it's what we, you know, used to call um, uh, this dualistic development. You know, there's an old school where uh, 
we used to talk in terms of dualistic economic development and and uh, mexico begins to look very much like an, an example of a dualistic development where you got one part of the economy which is doing well but uh, the bulk of where all the people are you know the large part of the workforce uh, is not in maquiladoras that's outside of maquiladoras and they are in, employed in these very low productivity low wage uh, activities mm. so uh we're uh, just about out of time do do you have any closing thoughts any sort of general takeaways that person who has listened to this conversation should have uh, feel feel free to uh, to also to make a case for why people should uh, buy the book <laughs> thank you <laughs> well you know uh, i i think for the developing countries this is a subject uh, particularly that they need to look at uh, very carefully so that for that reason they should definitely buy the book it's also very readable by the way you know i mean uh, yeah. uh, i i don't sacrifice any rigor in the book so so i i, I, I the arguments are uh, presented with rigor but in very accessible way so you don't have to be an economist to understand the book uh if you are uh, you know a devoted reader uh, with an interest in uh, the questions that the book raises uh, then then i think uh, uh, you will be able to understand it uh, and uh, i i also think that you know um uh, we all uh, those of us who have interest in uh, growth and development uh, need to take uh, uh, arguments for protection uh by the critics uh, with some grain of salt uh, I, i firmly i try to show in this book you know it it it, it puts the argument in this manner that uh, it, it about you know 1845 a uh, first rate author uh, Fred, uh, frederick bastiat had written a famous book which uh, today remains very uh, uh, valid even today uh, called economic sophisms where he says that you know uh, often uh, the the uh, case for against free trade and case for protection uh, is based on half truths and uh, uh, all the critics have to do is to basically state their half truths and then it is left to the free traders or the economists to counter those arguments to uh, uh, explain why they are wrong and they therefore have to then write very long dissertations to to explain that and that sort of remains true so it is good to have some healthy skepticism when such arguments get made uh because uh, uh, as the book illustrates in a variety of different ways that uh, once you put these to scrutiny uh, uh they turn out to be actually only half truths uh so that is i think uh, my my uh, bottom line i would give out uh, uh, to the readers or to the potential readers All right, uh, my guest today has been Arvind Panagaria. The book is Free Trade and Prosperity: How Openness Helps Developing Countries Grow Richer and Combat Poverty, which I'll link to at economicsdetective.com. Arvind, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you, Garrett. It has been a great pleasure for me chatting with you. Hi listeners, hope you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio. If you're a fan of the show and you want to discuss it with other people, you can join our Facebook group. That's Economics Detective on Facebook. It's a group you need to request to join it and just answer a few questions about how many episodes you've listened to and what your favorite ones are. Easy stuff. I encourage you to go join that so we can start building a, a community around the show uh, i like to have feedback and to just know that you're listening and that's a good way to do it another way you can uh, let me know you're listening is by supporting me through patreon go to economicsdetective.com and there's a link to my patreon page where you can make a small per episode donation just to think of it as a, a tip to just help give me a little push towards recording more interviews And a special thanks to all the people who already do that. Uh you're great and you are part of the reason the show is still going. So thanks. I'll be back next week with another interview if all goes well. 